Bibles, if we could turn there, Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, we'll begin our reading together. I entitled my message, A Salvation That Never Grows Old. Mark chapter 6, verse 46. And let's notice what the Bible says for us here this morning. The Bible says, And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Now, contextually, we're talking about Jesus here, and he sent his disciples away. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. It's interesting to note here that Jesus allows them to struggle for a period of time, before he approaches them, and he wasn't even going to board their ship. The Bible says in verse 48, he was going to walk past them, except they invite him into the ship. You know, I think it's important for us to understand about the character of God is he's not going to budge himself into your life. He wants to be invited. And the Bible says to acknowledge God, and he will direct your path. And so we need to invite the Lord in our life and The Bible says, and when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Now, I want us to notice what verse 52 says in our Bibles together. It says, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word, and we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to be able to study it together and to learn from it. And we're grateful for this passage of Scripture that teaches us that we indeed have a wonderful salvation, and that we can enjoy the wonderful benefits of being your child. And I pray, Lord, that if we are passive in our salvation today as Christians, I pray that today we would be stirred in our heart. And if we're an individual here that is not a Christian, that have not put their faith and trust in you, I pray that today they would do that and that they would trust in you, and that they would look to you in these days. So, Lord, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to be able to study your word together. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The story before us, I believe, is one with an incredible spiritual lesson. Jesus, in the context of Scripture here, Jesus had just performed an incredible miracle feeding over 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two small fishes. Now, if you've ever hosted anyone in your home, you know that feeding a group of people of any size with five loaves and just two small fishes is an impossible task, but feeding over 5,000 people, now that takes the work of God uh, to accomplish And so we see that Jesus sat them down by ranks, 50 people, 100 people. Our God is an organized God. And he tells us that his church ought to be uh, run decently and in order because he's a God of order. And we see the preparation of God. The Bible says that Jesus looked up to heaven and he gave thanks. He blessed the food. And then he started to, to break off that bread and he broke apart those fishes and, uh, and the incredible thing is, is that as he was breaking that bread and breaking those fishes, the supply never ran out. I mean, wouldn't it have been incredible to be able to see this, to be able to watch this take place as Jesus is breaking the bread and that supply is never running out? 
In Mark chapter 6, verse 42, the Bible says that they all ate and they were filmed. And we see not only the preparation of God, but we notice also the provision of God. The provision, of course, is an interesting word. Uh, when you think about it, pro means before and vision means to see. And so provision means that God sees our need before we even know we have a need. And God already meets that need. And I, I love what the Bible says in verse 38. Jesus asked, how many loaves do you have? And they said, uh, well, we don't know. And Jesus said, well, go and see. And uh, we see that in this passage of Scripture in verse 45, we see that Jesus constrains his disciples. In this passage of Scripture, he constrains his disciples to get onto a ship. And I think as we think of the provision of God to see before, I think we also understand as Bible students that God didn't just see the need, God also saw the storm. Do you believe that? He knew that there was going to be a storm, and yet he constrained his disciples to get onto the ship. The word there, constrained, means he forcibly placed them on that ship knowing that there was going to be some trouble that was going to take place in just hours after that. And so the Bible says he constrained them, and we see the providence of God in the context of this story because Jesus knew what was best for his disciples as he's trying to stretch their faith. And I believe that God constrains us and brings us into places in our life and circumstances in our life to stretch our faith. And maybe you're here this morning because God has placed you in those circumstances in your life where your, your faith is being stretched. And maybe it is those circumstances that are drawing you to God and you're seeking God. God knows what is best for our life and God has a plan and God has a purpose. And so they're in this ship and the Bible says a storm comes. A storm comes. And the Bible says the disciples are rowing and, and they're toiling, but they're not getting anywhere. They're not making any headway. And the Lord sees them and he comes to them. And I'm glad that Jesus, he sees us in our affliction. I'm glad that he sees us in the storms of our life. And Jesus, he sees their affliction and he comes to them and he comes to them in a miraculous fashion. He's walking on the water. He's walking on the sea. And the Bible says that he would have walked by them, but they acknowledged him. And we see that Jesus responds to their acknowledgement. We see also, I think, in the context of our story, I think we see the power of God. The power of God. The, the Bible says he went up into the ship, I'm not sure how it took place. I, I'm not sure if he floated up or if he just appeared there. I, I, I don't know, or maybe they helped him up. I, the Bible doesn't, doesn't say. I mean, nothing's really off limits here. We're talking about God. In Matthew 14, the Bible says that Peter actually walked on water to come to Jesus. All of this is happening. Same story, all right? Just different perspective, different gospel. In, in Matthew 14, it's the same story. And Mark doesn't write about it because his focus is on Jesus as the Son of God, but Matthew's writing about it. And so, you know, Peter's trying to walk on the water, and, and you know that story. He bids Peter to come on out, and Peter walks on the water, but he sinks when he sees the storm, and he realizes, wait a minute, I, I can't walk on water. And he begins to sink, and Jesus stretches out his hand, and, and he helps Peter and we see in this story the patience of God, the patience of God. The disciples' mouth is wide open at this point as they're seeing all of these things take place. I mean, Jesus is walking on water. Peter's walking on water. I, I mean, they are amazed above measure. In Mark chapter 6, verse 51, Mark's perspective of the story is that the disciples, he says, they're sore amazed. They're amazed above measure. I, I mean, the word sore means to throw over or beyond. They're, they're beyond normal amazement of what is happening in this scripture. And for the first time, Peter's speechless, doesn't know what to say, all that happens. 
And John records that when Jesus got aboard their vessel, they were immediately at their destination. Now, that's an interesting thing because the wind is contrary to them. They're trying to row. They're trying to get there. They're trying to make headway, but they can't make headway because the storm is fighting against them. And yet when Jesus gets on board, we see the progress of God in this passage of Scripture because when God gets on board, we get to where we need to be. And we, we see in this passage of Scripture that they get to the, the destination because when God is on board our ship, we're heading in the right direction. And so we see the progress of God. And the Bible says that they are impressed with this miracle. I mean, they're, they're amazed at what God can do because he said, peace be still, and it was still on that sea. And then the Bible, which is its best commentary, tells us why they were sore amazed. Because the Bible says in Mark 6, 52, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. The word they're hardened here is used to describe the dulling of the intelligent the dulling of the intelligent. In other words, they were indifferent. Now, think about this. This will help us. They were indifferent to a greater miracle that the miracle of Jesus walking on water amazed them so. I'll say that again. They were indifferent to a greater miracle. Now, I believe that if you're a Christian today, God performed the greatest miracle that he ever performed in making a sinner a child of God. You don't understand what it cost God to perform that miracle in your life. And so I want us to notice this, first of all, if you're taking notes, I want us to write this down, an, an extraordinary saving an extraordinary saving. Now, salvation is not an ideology. And salvation is not an opinion of God. Salvation is in itself an event that has happened in your heart. When you realize your sinful condition and you place your faith in Jesus and him alone for salvation... I believe with all my heart that the greatest miracle by far in the Bible occurs. We become a child of God. Now, I understand that we may not understand, and I don't understand all the theology of salvation. But I do believe that after salvation, we continue to grow and we continue to learn about the God who saved us and about the wonderful salvation that he has performed in our life. But why is this salvation so great? Can I kind of lay it out for you and do my best to help us to understand why this is by far the greatest miracle that has ever occurred? First of all, I want us to think about the fact that we are reconciled to God. We are reconciled to God. Now, that may not mean much to you, but it means a whole lot to God. You see, sin has separated us from God. We were created to have a relationship with God, but sin has made us the very enemy of God. And friend, today you may have lots of enemies in your life, but you don't want God as your enemy. And the Bible says it this way. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, the apostle Paul says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Now understand what the Bible says. We were enemies and we were reconciled. Reconciled means to change from enemy to friend. And that is an incredible thing. To be changed from the enemy of God to be the friend of God. But how could it ever happen? I mean, if we are sinners and God is 100% holy, 
How could God ever look, overlook your sinful nature? How could God ever overlook my sinful nature? Well, here's the answer. God sent his only begotten son. And Jesus died. Jesus is God in the flesh. And Jesus died in our place. And the Bible says that he became sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Think about this. The sinless son of God became our sin. The Bible says he became the sin of the world. All of the vile things that humanity has done through the passage of time was laid upon the son of God. All of those lies and filthy lusts of the flesh and all of those unthinkable acts of hate and injustice, all of the unholy thoughts, all nailed to Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he died. He died. He bore our shame and he bore our sin. And Paul says that God could remain just God would never blemish his nature. He could stay just, but at the same time be the justifier of all who believe in Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says that he became our sin. Jesus died for our sin, but also the sin of the entire world. 1 John chapter 2, in verse 2, the Bible says, and he is our, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says he took our cross. He shed, Jesus shed his precious blood, his sinless blood for you and for me. And so he became my sin, but he also robes us in his righteousness. Now, that's a great deal, don't you think? I mean, think about it. He takes our sin He takes our place, and he gives us his righteousness. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so we are robed in the righteousness of God and by grace we are declared righteous. And what does it mean for us? Well, it means that we now have access to God. We have a relationship with God where once we were separated from God, where once we were the enemy of God. Now we become the friend of God. And it means when we pray, God hears our prayer through Jesus Christ, not based on my merit, but based on the merit of his own only begotten son. And so the Bible says in Romans 5, 2, by whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And Paul told the church of Ephesus in Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have boldness and access. We can now talk to God. And friend, you don't have to pray through me or any man. You can pray directly to God through Jesus Christ. You are now a high priest, and you can talk to God. And here's the thing. He hears that prayer. He listens to what you have to say. The hymn writer said, are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. And if you're a Christian today, you can tell it to Jesus. And so we see this extraordinary saving. We were the enemies of God and now we become a a child of God, a friend of God, and God hears our prayers and He leads us and guides us, and we have a relationship with him. And if you're taking notes, would you write this down? Number two, I want us to think about an ensuing state, an ensuing state. John chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifest forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 3, the Bible says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord 
and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Revelation chapter 2 in verse number 4, the Bible says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You see, it is easy for us to have an extraordinary saving, to be a born-again Christian, but to not understand how wonderful and how great it is to know Jesus as our Savior. It is totally possible today for you to be sitting here in church and to take for granted the wonderful salvation that you have in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, not to neglect so great of a salvation. Now, why does this happen? Well, first of all, I want us to think about the fact that it elevates fear over faith. It elevates fear over faith. The Bible says in our text here in chapter 6, verse 50, for when they saw him and were troubled and immediately talked with him and said unto them, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. It is easy for us as Christians, I'm talking to Christians here this morning, it is easy for us to become indifferent to the salvation that we have, that we don't trust God, and we elevate our fears over trusting the Lord. And by the way, that's what happened to the disciples in this passage of Scripture. Their fears were elevated over their faith because they considered not the greatness of God. They considered not the greater miracle that God already performed. But I think also it erodes our perception of God. It erodes our perception of God. Psalm chapter 78, verse 19, Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Mark chapter 10, verse 27, And Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. You see, when we become indifferent in our salvation, it erodes our perception of God, and we begin to think, can God help my life? Can God help my children? Can God help my marriage? Can God help me find a job? Can God help me become the person that I ought to be? And we begin to question God. We begin to question our perception of God. Who is God? What can God do? And that is because we become indifferent in our Christian life. I believe this, when we become indifferent in our Christian life, it eliminates joy and excitement in our life. The Christian life becomes to be a duty. Well, I have to go to church. I have to read the Bible. I have to pray. Friend, you don't have to do anything. You get to go to church. You get to read the Bible. You get to pray. And so we lose that excitement in serving God and following God. We, learn, we lose that excitement in the opportunity to be a part of what God would have us to do. Thirdly, and I'll be done, I want us to think about an enjoyable salvation. An enjoyable salvation. The Bible says it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1. Can we turn there, 2 Peter Chapter 1 and verse number 10. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse number 10. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse number 10. The Bible says this, Second Peter chapter 1 verse 10, Wherefore the rather brethren, now he's speaking of Christians to Christians here. He's speaking... If you know the Lord as your Savior, this is a message for you. It's a message for me. 
He says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Now, this is what Peter is teaching us in this passage of Scripture, is that you need to be saved. Are, are you listening? You need to be saved, and you need to know it. You need to be saved, and you need to know it. If you have any doubts in your salvation, then, friend, deal with those doubts. Don't continue in your life doubting if you are a child of God. You will never, listen, you will never enjoy the benefits and blessing of being a child of God if you're walking around like a question mark wondering if you're a part of his family. And Peter is saying in this passage of Scripture, Christians, listen, give diligence, take time, and make sure that you know that you are a Christian. And stand up and live in that confidence in your Christian life. And if you know that you're a Christian today and you are just living in indifference, I'll, I'll tell you something, it is easy to become an indifferent Christian. It can happen overnight. It can happen and you don't even know it where you're just sitting and listening and nodding your head thinking, that's wonderful, Pastor Burns, that's great, but it doesn't impact your life. It doesn't make you a better Christian. You don't ask God, look at my heart and see if there's something that needs to be changed. You're just going through the motions, and you have, if you were honest, you have missed the miracle of eternal life because it is incredible. And so what should you do? Well, number one, you should confess it. You should confess it today. You should say, Lord, it is wrong. It is sin. And the Bible says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Ignoring it is not the answer. It is not the answer. You need to acknowledge it. You need to confess it before God. And you need God to help you. And then I say, you need to obey the Lord. Whatever God is directing in your life, maybe it's for uh, baptism or church membership or, or maybe it's some other area in your life that you're putting it off or you're trying to ignore it and God is working in your life. Friend, listen today. You need to obey the Lord today. Say yes to Jesus today. And then I say serve other people. Serve other people you see, we become indifferent when it's all about us, when it's all about us. Sometimes we can sit in the pew of a church and we can listen and listen and listen and we can kind of have the attitude, feed me, give me, you know, what, what do I need? And, and yet, you know, all of those things are important and we need to grow. But what are you doing to help somebody else grow? What are you doing to help another Christian to succeed? And so I say serve other people. Mark chapter 9, verse 41, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, look at this, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. I say to you today, friend, to serve other people, to be in the business, God's business, of being a blessing to others. John chapter 14, can I leave you with this? Let's turn there. John chapter 14, and we'll be done this morning, and verse number 27. The Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, and verse number 27. And notice what Jesus says here in this passage of Scripture. John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior today, then the invitation is simple. Put your faith and trust in him. But if you're a Christian 
that is indifferent to the work of God in your life, if you find yourself just kind of going through the motions and and today maybe church is just tradition and it's not about transformation, it's not about what God can do in my life, but it's I go to church because that's the right thing to do and it is the right thing to do. But friend, today maybe you've lost that spark in what it means to be born again. I hope that you'll find it here this morning, and I hope that you will get excited about what God has for you, because I'm here to tell you it's the greatest thing in all the world to live for Jesus. Let's pray together.